first thing I want to begin with is I want to say like a big thank you to the GopherCon organizers for putting all this stuff together. That's super amazing. And for really giving me a platform to talk about this stuff uh, because I am super passionate about it. And uh, I think it's really important. So thank you. I've been trying to get into GopherCon for a long time to actually have, uh, to talk, to have the chance to uh, present about stuff. Um, and now on the fifth year, I think I finally got in. So yes, I did this. So that means that you can do it too. So that's said, let's jump right into this. So the obligatory who am I slide that everyone, should, uh, everyone has. So first things first, I am from Portland, Oregon, a sunny, beautiful Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's not sunny. Side note, um, I have been working in, in back end for about 15 years, give or take. Uh, I've been writing Go for about six years. I've been really lucky to have the chance to just work in Go pretty much uh, <laughs> the last last uh, five plus years um, and barely touch any other languages. It's really cool. Um, I really like working on distributed systems. And I was previously, I've spent, uh, well, a lot of time at data centers. I've been at New Relic, Envision, DigitalOcean, Community, uh, which is a, a startup that deals with SMS stuff. <clears throat> and most recently, I co-founded my own company called Batch.sh, <clears throat> which focuses on uh, essentially uh, observing data streams. That's really what it's about. And like streams of data that uh, may appear on various complex uh, message buses and so on. And a cool fact is that we managed to get into YC, which is pretty awesome. Uh, kind of came out of nowhere. And a final tidbit is that I am actually from Latvia. So now you can say that you know somebody uh, that's a distributed systems engineer that is very cold, by the way, just like it is in Latvia. <laughs> All right. Cool, let's get started. So uh, I'm gonna start with a small disclaimer here. So this is totally not a hypothetical talk. Uh, this is, there's really no theory in this. This is about stuff that I've done in production. It's real and it's stuff that I am doing right now in production. So um, that's, that's something you, you can take away from that. Um, the other part is that I am going to try to keep it real uh, as in just, mention the things that are actually hard, the things that are actually not so hard, and I'll put it right out there. And then ultimately, I really want to make sure that you level up after uh, hearing, hearing my talk. In general, there's nothing worse than, I think, uh, listening or having somebody talk at you for 45 minutes and you having to walk away. Thank you. You having to walk away with not having learned anything at all. So the goal here is that you walk away with something. So <clears throat> let's start with what are we trying to solve? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take reliability to the next level. Um, and by next level, I mean how to improve a system that is already pretty good, right? Um, so if we look into that, the first thing that might come to mind is, of course, you know, utilizing microservices. So you are going to split up your monolith. <clears throat> you realize that, like, oh, it's much easier to actually manage this entire beast if you have microservices, great. If you have microservices, you want to be able to actually reproduce them somehow and deploy them and do something with them. So you would probably utilize containers and some sort of orchestration like Kubernetes and so on. Great, makes sense. Then you would actually want to make sure that you're able to deploy this stuff in a reliable fashion, right? So you would use blue-green deploys or canary deploys or some sort of another deployment uh, strategy. You also might utilize a service mesh and the service mesh is going to enable your services to talk to each other uh, easily and be able to discover your services easily. And then you might also add circuit breakers, basically patterns that will ensure that your code is able to deal with network hiccups and so on and so on. So you might be saying from all of this, like first off, is this the talk where this dude is just going to talk about all these things again? <laughs> and no, I am not going to talk about all those things again. Uh, I am actually going to say that um, we could just do better than that, right? Um, there's a, we're, all those things right there are already good. Uh, it's just the fact that uh, 
we could do a little bit better. We can just add some things and just adjust it a little bit. And I would even go so far as to say that we could probably remove some of those things as well from that, uh, from that entire stack, which would reduce our complexity in exchange for some complexity. So the thing that I'm talking about is event-driven and the concepts of event-driven. So uh, since everybody's super smart and everybody is able to pick this up really quick, I'm going to try to do this in about like five minutes or so. It's never worked out to be five minutes, but I'm going to try anyway. So event-driven is an architectural and system design pattern. Uh, think basically like a microservices pattern, right? Uh, in event-driven, event-driven consists basically of three actions, which is emitting something, consuming something, and reacting so to something. And you might actually not react to anything like after you even consume it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if one of those happens then all the other three actions have to happen as well. Now I mentioned, I, I say the word event and really it's synonymous with a message. And that is synonymous with essentially a unit of work. I think it was Honeycomb, speaking of distributed tracing, Honeycomb uh, wrote an article, I think like two or three years ago, and it's, it's super awesome. It talks about uh, what, is, uh, what is the difference between a log entry and an event. And the thing that it came down to was that essentially an event is uh, actionable, right? And they define it as a unit of work. And that's really, that's all that it is about. It's something that you can actually guarantee being able to perform an action off of, right? Where a log entry might be more of like an informational thing. So the event uh, must be, or the events, and where they're coming from, must be the source of truth. All events must be communicated through an event, uh, event bus or a message bus. Um, and that could be, I mean, uh, the definition of an event bus is really kind of loose. We could be even using Redis. It might not be the best choice, but the point is some sort of a method to actually send messages through. Um, all the services must be idempotent. And that's really just a big word for the fact that we just want to make sure that um, that our service is able to deal with duplicate events. And we want to make sure that our service is able to deal with out of order events. Which is, uh, if you add state into the, all of this, it's not really that terribly complicated. So, <clears throat> And then uh, we also must be okay with eventual consistency. This is kind of a, uh, this is a big one because uh, getting everybody to be on the same page and agree that it's okay uh, that we cannot guarantee consistency, it's kind of a big, big deal. Um, the whole point of that really is, right, is that you are, you are trusting that the system will eventually become consistent enough for everything to operate correctly. The uh, most important part of all this is that your single service, I think from all of this stuff, all of these points are important, but the one most important point is that, uh, your service should only care about its own state and nobody else's. That's it. It shouldn't even know about anything else that is happening on the system at all. I think that's a, a really important like building, uh, building block of this entire thing. Uh, all this stuff is quite easily achievable, but the moment that this is, the moment you violate this rule, you kind of lose the benefits of actually even doing anything event-driven uh, to begin with. So. <clears throat> So what are the components in, in event-driven? So of course you have an event bus. That's where all the messages are going to be passing through. I would suggest in this case for an event bus to use RabbitMQ. Uh, it is not written in Go, it is written in Erlang. Um, however, it is still very, very good. Um, and specifically, it has an extremely versatile routing config, uh, meaning that uh, instead of having to update your code to do some sort to implement some sort of functionality, you can just utilize uh, stuff that's already built into RabbitMQ. Uh, it is medium fast. It does about 20,000 messages a second, uh, for about like two to four kilobytes in size, I think. Um, and uh, it is extremely reliable. I have used RabbitMQ for many years now, and there is practically no babysitting uh, associated with it. Some some cons that, uh, about RabbitMQ though are that it is not distributed, and I don't think it ever will be, but it does have various failover options and high availability options to a point where it's okay to have this idea of introducing essentially a single point of failure, but that single point of failure is extremely unlikely to actually fail, which are generally the famous last words, but you know, uh, 
for the most part, it's okay. So uh, the second part is caching in a config layer. And really, it should be also kind of like a state layer. Um, and this is a piece that uh, you never hear folks talk about at all when we're talking about event-driven or the various like umbrella architectures of event-driven. This is what I think enables uh, building really stable and really scalable systems to begin with. Um, so a config layer is essentially some sort of a way for your service to retain its state and be able to get its state back after it, the service has been restarted or it comes back from a crash or whatever other sort of thing. And that config layer, or still all the, all the components that we're talking about here, they need to be centralized dependencies. And so you want them to be extremely, extremely reliable, right? So uh, in this particular case, I think there is really one massive contender, and that is etcd. And etcd is uh, distributed. It's a distributed key value store. And the biggest thing about it is, is that, or the best thing about it is, really, is that it's extremely, extremely rock solid. It just works. Um, I have used etcd for an extremely long time. And I've had clusters of sizes of 5 to 9, I think like 11 nodes or so. And with uh, links between all the cluster nodes having an excess of 200 milliseconds, milliseconds of latency or so. And it still survives without a problem. The other part is that, yeah, it's written in Go. It is used by Kubernetes right now. Uh, it has been used now for quite a while. It is medium fast, meaning that it's about, it can do about 20,000 messages a second as well. Um, but again, the most important part of it is the fact that it's, it's essentially, it's so ridiculously stable. So uh, with that said, that's actually all the components that you need to build an event-driven system. It might not be amazing, but it's going to be enough. So with that said, you, there are some bonuses that you can add into all this stuff as well. So you can have a long-term event storage, uh, and that's essentially a way for you to say, I would like to see or uh, keep a history of every single event that has ever happened on, on um, my entire system. And for that, you would need to put it into something, right? Like store all of these events. And unless you're running your own object store and you're comfortable with running Ceph or you're comfortable with running uh, Minio or something like that, I would just suggest for the mere mortals to use S3 because it's really cheap. Uh, it is quite fast, it is quite reliable as well. Uh, there's really no reason not to use it. And on top of it, it, ex it, it gets exposed in so many different ways. You can uh, have uh, like use Athena to access it and so on. But of course, you also need some way to actually get all of these events into the object store in the first place. So you would have to potentially build some sort of a way to like some sort of a method to archive all of these events that are coming there. So you could use all kinds of stuff. You could use Debezium, you could use Spark, some sort of Spark jobs, um, or you could just build something. And in that case, I would totally suggest to just build something. It is much easier because you could just, uh, you're probably going to have some sort of custom logic in there that you're going to, to want to basically expand this thing. And generally, it is pretty simple uh, to begin with. So um, I have now worked with practically, I think, every, every supported message, message broker library in Go. And they're all pretty good. They all work really well. So there's really no reason to say like, oh, I'm not going to do this in Go. Uh, I'm going to do this in Java or something like that. Instead, you don't really need to do that. It, uh, there are plenty of client-side libraries that do all this stuff. So cool. Congratulations. You have now learned event-driven. That was not five minutes, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's probably more than that. So. All right. So how does all of this actually translate to improve reliability? Well, the first thing here is that uh, we are talking about essentially async. Uh, everything is async. Everything is becoming async at that point. So what you're gaining by just doing things the uh, event-driven way, you gain automatic recovery. That's actually built into your code purely off of, based on the fact that you have written a consumer that is going to consume your messages. That means that if your service is down at the time, when it comes back, it is going to just automatically consume all the messages that it has missed. That's it. It's as simple as that. It doesn't know that there are messages that are missed. It doesn't know that it was down. You haven't added any sort of additional uh, logic into your code or anything like that to actually know that, 
oh, I need to recover now. No, that this all comes by default just from the fact that like, well, your service came back up and now it's consuming everything. So the second thing is that uh, your failure domain has now been reduced dramatically. You now have a situation where uh, if we look back at the, one of the previous slides where we were talking about um, the service should only care about itself and nobody else, that means that you, your service is no longer talking to service B, C, D, or E, and so on and so on and all in your microservice stack. You only care about yourself. That means that you have practically no dependencies except these centralized dependencies, right? Uh, like of RabbitMQ and etcd or whatever. Um, so basically, yeah, it's less things to fail. There's true service autonomy. The fact that uh, from an organizational point of view, you are no longer depending on another team and thus the reliability of team B or C does not impact you in any way, shape or form, right? Just because uh, service C has a poor response time or something like that, your SLAs are not going to be affected by it. There's also going to be less infrastructure. So when we're talking about a service mesh, uh, specifically for the fact of uh, to add uh, the functionality of uh, being able to uh, discover where all these other services are at, you no longer care about other services. You no longer talk to them. You're just talking to an event bus, so you don't actually have a need to discover anything at all. Uh, so, and on the same page, you no longer need to actually even care about uh, the uh, some sort of encryption methods to that you know to enable talking between services. That stuff is gone. You no longer need it really. So we could just take that out. And finally, the biggest one of all of these is the fact that uh, you have a dramatically lower attack surface because now you have the ability to basically put in an ACL, which is going to, uh, into you, like you know your network stack or whatever, that says that nothing can talk to anything. <laughs> you could basically put in a deny all for all outbound traffic that is on your inter for your internal network for for your even external network, and say that well there are only two places that the services can talk to. That's the event bus, and that is you know my the caching layer of etcd or whatever else, and I think that's amazing. That's uh, that's what I have done um, for for quite a while now, and it's just an easy checkbox that you can get, right? To say like, yep, we are significantly more secure because we do not have to punch holes really ever to say like, oh, service A actually can talk to service you know G or whatever. So, so let's talk about what this actually looks like, uh, as in we're going to look at some code. Obviously this is not production ready code, but it generally gives you an idea as to like what this will actually look like and it will prepare you for when we do a brief demo of some of these concepts to begin with. So <clears throat> from the top, what we're looking at is we are going to be setting up an event bus and the event bus is going to return an instance of the event bus. In this case, it's going to be rabbit. You can see right here that there's already an import there. Um, after, after that is done, all the event bus, by the way, that all that it is is that we're just defining where we're going to connect to and what kind of messages we care about. Um, after we get re receive an event bus, we're going to call on the consume method and we're going to pass to it a consumer func. And consumer func is essentially going to be executed every single time that a message actually comes in um, or uh, comes into RabbitMQ and RabbitMQ uh, passes it to our service. Finally, we're also going to run a producer in here as well, which is essentially just going to periodically produce some messages. So what does setup event plus look like? Pretty simple. We don't have to go into each one of these, but the, the idea is that we're using this Rabbit library. Um, it's a wrapper that we wrote uh, for RabbitMQ. It's, it actually wraps the AMQP, uh, the, I think it was uh, Stredway. Yeah, Stredway AMQP. <clears throat> it wraps that library. Uh, and as reconnect support and some other like uh, quality of life things. So we're using that to connect to local host and we're basically saying, because of these binding keys, we're saying that if any producer writes any sort of messages to the events exchange, then forward it or forward a copy of it to my queue. And that basically means, right, that this could, because we have a consumer set up here, that RabbitMQ is going to forward a message from, uh, is going to forward a message when it comes into my queue, which is ultimately going to fire this consumer func because we have this, that here. So what does the consumer func look like? Consumer func receives a copy of uh, AMQP delivery. AMQP de delivery has a bunch of different metadata about the message itself, 
it'll have the body, it'll have various headers, uh, all, all kinds of things related to specifically to RabbitMQ. The thing that we care about the most though is the body, right? the actual payload of what was sent in uh, by somebody that produced a message. So in this case, we're going to assume that the body is going to contain a map string interface. And all we're doing is we're just essentially unmarshalling that, uh, uh, JSON unmarshalling that body to that. Then we are performing, uh, we're just checking to see if uh, the type key exists in this map that we, uh, that we unmarshaled. And if it does, then we're going to perform a switch on the message type and uh, see if it is new order. If it is new order, then we execute some function somewhere to do something uh, with the contents that we unmarshaled. Um, in this case, process new order, we don't really care what it's even doing. The point is that it's now it has the chance to do something with it because it has identified what kind of a message it is. Finally, there's the producer. So the producer, all, all it's really doing here is that it's running in a forever for loop. And it is generating some JSON with a random UUID for the user ID. And then the only line that matters here really is, is it's not really even complex, but uh, the only line that matters is the publish, right? And the, all the publish is doing is just writing to this uh, routing key that we don't, it doesn't matter what routing key we're even using, foo or whatever, because when we configured the event bus in one of the previous slides, right, um, in, in here, because we have a pound here, it means basically it's a wildcard. So we can write any sort of a routing key and it's going to end up going to uh, to RabbitMQ and have RabbitMQ forward it over to my queue instead. So, fantastic. So let's do, now that like we generally understand uh, what it's supposed to look like, let's do a demo of building a fairly simplistic event-driven system. I have all this code available on GopherCon 2021 under the BatchCorp org. Uh, it's all in there and there's a pretty decent readme explaining all this stuff. So. Without further ado, you now have the ability to look at this mesmerizing, incredible uh, diagram. And what you can tell here is that uh, I got carried away with an Apple Pen with an iPad. It is pretty sweet. Um, and I started enjoying coloring things. So once you uh, get past that point, um, what it's really like showing you here is that what we're going to do is uh, we have two services. We have the orders and the notification service. And those are going to be listening to RabbitMQ. There's going to be a producer, some sort of a third party that is going to pro, uh, produce an event. And once it, is, uh, once it goes into RabbitMQ, the important thing here is the producer is not talking to notifications or to the order service. The producer is going to be talking just to RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is going to forward the new order message to orders and to notifications. And the two services are going to do something with based on that message. In this case, it says, uh, you know, hypothetically, that orders is going to be talking to a shipping service and notifications is going to talk to Slack uh, to send some sort of a notification and so on. For our case, there's really no reason for us to talk to these outside dependencies. We're just simply going to uh, send some sort of metrics out. That's it, just to be able to visualize the fact that, that something is happening. So, um, also, I'm going to, the way I've set up the demo is that uh, so that we do not have two separate code bases altogether for the services we are just going to pass in an NVAR, which is going to specify the name of the service to begin with. Um, <clears throat> so that way we can just run uh, an arbitrary number of different, different services, so to speak, uh, just based up, just by providing it a different name. So the first example is going to be a no thrills example. So let's just do all of that really quick. So <clears throat> I am going to go into here and this is our code here. So I'm already in GopherCon. There's a Docker compose file. And you'll see that a Docker compose has RabbitMQ at CD and it has a Graphite StatsD setup. Um, we're not going to be using etcd yet in, in this first case uh, of the demo. We're just going to be using RabbitMQ, but we will be using Graphite StatsD. All it is is just basically a combo Docker container that has a statsd server, which is meant for aggregating metrics, and Graphite to actually visualize all that stuff. So you can basically think of it as uh, a simpler Grafana plus Influx, InfluxDB. That's essentially all it is. So, all right, so we're going to start that up really quick. Let's do that. <coughs> Let's do that really 
quick. Uh, if I had an M1, maybe this would be a little bit faster, but it is what it is. All right. <clears throat> Do that. And while that stuff is starting up, we can already start looking through some of this code as well. So this is the GoFocon 2021 repo. We are under the service directory right here. Okay, so let's start looking through main. Um, it will look fairly familiar, right, uh, to the previous example that I was giving. So the only thing here is that uh, we are going to be looking for the service name NVAR. The service name, if it's not provided to us, then we're just going to bail out, right? And instead of just setting up the event bus, we're just going to have something a little bit more generic. Um, we're going to be setting up all of our dependencies. So we'll set up the dependencies. After we set up the dependencies, we're going to do something similar to what we saw in the, in the screenshots of the code, which is we're going to launch off of the dependencies. Uh, we already can tell that dependencies is going to create an event bus. So off of the event bus that's in dependencies, we're going to launch a consumer in a dedicated Go routine. And we're going to tell it to do the same thing, execute something uh, or execute this particular function right here, um, the consumer function. So, and the final part is just a forever loop, right? Or a way to ensure that main doesn't really exit. That's all it is. So, um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at setup dependencies really fast. So setup dependencies, we instantiate depths. We're going to create an event bus, same thing as before. We're going to be listening to basically, uh, or we're going to listen for anything uh, that is, is written to the exchange called events and RabbitMQ then is going to forward that to, <clears throat> to a queue that we registered called service name dash Q. So in this case, orders dash Q and notifications dash Q. Great. After that is done, we instantiate the stats D client. That's essentially the client that we're going to be using to uh, bump basically some metrics. Have to do this sort of a thing purely for the demo, really, because uh, the metrics do not show up immediately in, gra in Graphite, so uh, it's easier to just simply say like, all right, here, here, there's some in here, so we're going to do a little bit earlier. And finally, we're creating state, but because, again, the first part of the demo doesn't actually utilize state, and we're just going to skip over this and what it's actually doing. It does get instantiated, but it gets instantiated with a no-op state, so even when it gets called, it's not really going to do anything at all. So. <clears throat> Back to, back to main. So in main then, the first thing that we do is we actually start consumer func, or, or the next thing after setting up the dependencies, we say that, like, okay, you need to execute consumer func. So what is consumer func? Again, very similar to what we had before, uh, but instead of you know, just unmarshalling it into a map string interface, now we actually have an event structure for it. So there's some sort of an envelope uh, for the sort of event that we are expecting. Now, in many cases, this could be protobuf, this could be Avro, this could be all kinds of encodings. It could be JSON. Um, it could be really anything. Uh, in this case, for the demo, uh, we're just assuming that it's going to be JSON. And the JSON is going to contain an ID, it's going to contain a type, and it's going to have args. The message type is really defined right there as a string, and there are a couple of message types, which is new order and uh, ban user. Same thing as before, we're going to unmarshal it, and then we're going to do a switch, uh, switch check on it to see if it's a new order. If it is a new order, we're going to execute process order. So what does process order do? We do not care about what it's doing with this uh, state stuff because, again, we're not making use of state yet. So it doesn't really matter, it's just, we can completely ignore it. The thing we should not ignore, though, is this is the part, actually, that is... Uh, this is really the, the magic of what's what's happening here, is that we're just going to bump a metric. That's essentially it via our stats D client, and the metric name is going to be service name new order OK. That's it. Um, after that, well, we do we do add this thing into state, but again, because we're not using state yet in this first example, it's going to be a no op, and it doesn't really matter. So let's start up these services. We're going to need two of them. Right, so let's start up this first one. Let's go into here. It's going to be service name equals to oh. uh, service name is orders. I cannot type because it's really cold in here. Make uh, no, 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 make. All right, that's one of them, and let's do the second one as well. Uh, And 
admin equals team. Uh, this is going to be the notification service. And let's just run this thing. Fantastic. Now that it's running, uh, let's go over to Graphite. Uh, we should have, have it running as well. So let's take a look at Docker, what's running in here. So there's RabbitMQ running, etcd is running, and Graphite is running as well. So we should be able to just go to that really quick and just see that it is available. So let's take a look at this. We're just gonna go to localhost and take a look at the metrics that we have in here. So we have two metrics or four metrics rather. So the notifications metric is here. If we're going to want to see that, we're going to want to see the order. Yeah, the orders, yep, metric as well. <coughs> Let's change this view to have the last five minutes. And just to ensure that we actually have, like that we can see this stuff pretty decently, let's take a look at, uh, let's change this to stacked mode as well. Okay, cool. So now <clears throat> we're finally going to write an event. We're going to be the producer. I'm going to use a CLI tool called Plumber. Uh, it's a CLI utility that we wrote ourselves. Uh, for ourselves really and it's essentially like a curl that is used for uh, For being able to read and write to various message buses So if you want to write to like Kafka or if you want to write to rabbit or Nats or whatever it doesn't really matter and it supports protobuf it Supports Avro flat buffer all kinds of other stuff. So that's what we're gonna use for the producer So that's what we're gonna do. So we're going to use plumber write um, we're going to say it's going to be written to rabbit. We do not have to specify the address because it's going to localhost anyways, but we will have to specify the exchange, which is going to be events. We're going to say that input is going to be, let's see, we know that there's got to be a type in there. So it's going to be new order. All right. And I think it had an ID as well in there. So let's just call it one, two, three. All right, and we're going to write it to a routing or using a routing key called foo because, again, it doesn't really matter. It could be go for con for all we care about. All right, so let's do that. Let's submit this message, and we can see that, great, these services automatically responded to them, or they, they picked up the messages because, uh, that because RabbitMQ forwarded them over to their queue. So if we go here and we perform a refresh, we can immediately see that, okay, cool. This, these messages came in. So similarly, if we were to do this a couple of times, if we were to uh, send a couple of these messages or a few of these messages to it, um, all of them are gonna come through. Fantastic, so if we go back to this and we would say now that we want to have, uh, if we want to improve this a little bit, well, um, do we need to do anything actually? And the answer is really no. If we want to add some sort of recovery to all of this, the recovery stuff is already built in, right? So that means that we could, at this point in time, we could just simply take down one of these services. So let's say we'll take down the notification service. And if we emit some messages to it, naturally what's going to happen is that, oh, uh, hold on, silly keys, there we go. If we emit some additional messages to it, um, the order service is going to pick it up, right? And the notification service is not going to see it. That's why we see only that the order service is right here. So, but the only thing to, what we need to do to, in order for, uh, to, for the notification services to recover is to simply start up. And we haven't actually added any code for recovery or anything like that. We just simply need to uh, just start it back up. So let's do that. If we just simply start it again, the first thing that it's going to do is that it will just process all the messages because it's essentially a consumer and all those messages are sitting in its queue. So if we were to just look at this again and refresh it, there is a notification service. So by doing basically nothing, we have managed to implement uh, automatic recovery into this entire thing. So the final part though is that like we don't actually have a fully, a fully well-designed uh, a vendor of a system yet for it to become or get to the next level really we need to have some sort of state so at this point we're going to be introducing etcd as well um, etcd and some sort of localized state so what that is going to look like let's just look through through code really quick on what it all means 
So, <clears throat> if we look in here, the set of dependencies, one of the parts that we do is that we instantiate new state and we pass it the service name. Cool. So, if we go in here, we're going, we can see immediately that we need to pass the enable state nvar uh, to ensure that it doesn't create a no-op entry of new state. So, one of the first things that we do is we create an etcd client. Uh, this is fairly standard code for just talking to etcd essentially. Um, and then we're going to instantiate uh, state and we're going to pass the etcd client and we're going to instantiate a couple of data structures as well. These, uh, like the entire purpose of, of, of uh, the state package is essentially to provide some way for you to uh, keep state in memory and be able to periodically flush it to somewhere. And the reason you're flushing it to somewhere is so that you can actually, uh, on startup, read all that stuff and, well, populate your internal cache and memory. That's all it is. So, uh, that is the reason why we're seeing the, the cache, the cache data structure and the flush data structure. Obviously, there's some mutexes in here as well because there's probably go routines involved that are going to be reading from the same place. So, mutexes are going to be necessary. Um, so, the first thing that we do after instantiating state is that we import all the cache. That is the piece that I was saying that, that after we have, uh, after the service starts up, the first thing that it should do is it should go out to etcd and say, hey, tell me everything that you know about, like, that you know about me. Um, and you're getting all the information. So, if we look at that, import cache, all it's doing is it's performing, it's performing a recursive, uh, with prefixes essentially, a recursive lookup. Uh, for anything under that prefix to, to give you uh, all the data. So in this case, we're going to go through the response and we're going to populate our cache with all the message IDs that we've seen in the past, right? Um, if we go back to here, after that, we will start a flusher. And the flusher is also really simple. The flusher is simply a go routine that gets executed and it has a ticker that runs every second. Every second that it runs is going to, it's going to go through the flush data, uh, data structure and it's going to flush it to, or it's going to put basically something in etcd. That's, that's all it's doing. And then it's going to delete the entry from flush so it, it knows that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to flush anything anymore. This is being used, the flush data structure is being used when you perform, when you perform an add, like when you're adding something into state, it's going to put it into, into the local in-memory cache, and at the same time, it's also going to put it into the flush data structure too. And uh, so that basically the flusher can, can get rid of it. So <clears throat> what you end up with in the end then is that in main, finally, when you get to the consumer function and we're processing the order, we, the first thing that we will do once we receive some sort of an event is we're going to see, and, uh, we're going to check to see if we know anything about this ID of this event. Um, and what it's going to be doing is it's just going to go into state and say like, hmm, do I, do we, do we know about this ID? And you know that even if you crash or something happens to you, that's the, that data is going to be in etcd no matter what. Right, it's already going to be there. So by the time that another service comes back up, uh, its cache is going to be populated with everything that was already there. And if it is not in there, uh, if it is not actually in our cache, then we're going to imp like then we're going to bump this metric again, and we're also going to add it into our state so that the next time that this uh, the request comes through, then it's most definitely going to sh uh, it's going to get uh, it's going to hit this part right here. So what we can see here is that if the if we are aware of this ID, then we're going to bump a different metric, which is going to be new order skipped, right, based on the service name. So what does this all look like if we are just going to start up these services right here? So if we do, I do not want to type this again. So that is the, come on. Fine, I'll type it again. So. That's the order service. And we will also need to do enable state. Equal, oh, state equals to true. Great, and we're going to do this one too, and then it's gonna say call state equals to true. All right, now we have both of these running. 
we can see that state was state tracking was enabled as well. So now what happens is that if we're going to execute this and we take a look uh, over over here, what we'll see is that great, both of them have received it. Both of them have actually done something with this metric. Uh, or both of them have done something with this, this message. So if we were to do it again, what we're going to see now is that if we, we just need to also graph these other metrics as well, new order skipped and new order skipped. We can see that the next message was automatically rejected, or in this case, it was we, we bumped this other metric, right? Because uh, no matter how many we're, we're going to send, <coughs> it's basically not going to reprocess them again because it already knows this ID in the first place, right? Um, and because of the stuff that we added into etcd, we can now basically shut down both of these services, start them back up, and do the same thing again. And the first thing that's going to happen is that it's going to see that this message has been already checked or has been already uh, processed, right? So there's basically no green or blue in there at all. Cool. So that right there concludes the third part of the demo. So let's continue this stuff. So I'll quickly briefly talk about the libraries that you just saw in here, the stuff that I think is super useful, really. So for RabbitMQ, uh, there is, of course, the Streadway and QP library. So it is super solid, and we just wanted to have some sort of a way to put uh, everything that's in that library and make it just a little bit easier to utilize. So things like automatic reconnects, uh, creating consumers, creating uh, uh, publishers, all that sort of stuff, we just wanted to make it a little bit easier. Um, for Kafka, even though there is no Kafka demoed here, I figured that it's a good idea to actually talk about Kafka as well. Um, for Kafka, there are two big libraries that are available. It is the Sarama library and the, and the Segment IO library. And both of them are really good at specific things, uh, meaning that, the, for instance, the Sarama library is really good at managing Kafka or performing tasks that are related to management. So things like, for instance, uh, topic control. Uh, on the other hand, the, the Segment IO library is really good at creating high throughput uh, consumers and producers and it works really well. Uh, we need both of those things, so we created another wrapper called KNG, and that's what we use uh, at, at our company. Finally, so, or rather next, is etcd. etcd is the, the standard client for etcd. It is fantastic. It works really, really great. Something I should have probably mentioned on here as well is that uh, if you're doing event-driven, you're probably doing a lot of async, and if you're doing async, you will want to have distributed locks or something like distributed mutexes. And the etcd client provides uh, an extra concurrency package that has things for uh, creating distributed locks, and that is super awesome because you uh, don't really want to implement it yourself. And because etcd is based on Raft, you can essentially piggyback off of that. Then for CLI debug stuff, you can totally use Plumber. I think it works fantastic for that. That's the reason we wrote it. We wrote it for ourselves to be able to work with event-driven systems a little bit easier. Um, and also because we utilize Rabbit and Kafka at the, at the same time for our entire system. So for UI de debug, uh, again, there's no Kafka in the demo, but CoughDrop is essentially a web-based UI for Kafka uh, for being able to see to view topic contents, for being able to uh, manage topics, like meaning add, add them, delete them, that sort of a thing. There's also a CD manager. Um, it's a fairly old project at this point, but it works really like remarkably well. It's also a web, uh, web-based UI um, for a CD, because otherwise you'd have to use a CLI to actually manage all your keys and so on. And again, something that I did not even talk about during this talk is uh, gRPC. But I figured that it's, it's worth uh, mentioning as well. Uh, this is basically like Postman, but for gRPC. And it's super awesome. It works really, really well. So for local metrics, something that you probably saw in the, in the demo is that there's StatsD and Graphite, which is essentially uh, like an Influx plus Grafana, uh, except significantly lighter and way less powerful as well, but uh, for just being able to quickly show metrics and be able to do something with them, uh, I think it's fantastic. And finally, 
there is an example service and a template that I uh, that my team everyone uses for all of our services. It has support for Kafka, Rabbit, etcd. Um, it has all the caching state stuff already built into it. It's fully tested. It has Docker support, and it has a I might say a very beautiful make file that has an awesome help output. So we use this for all of our services. We have about 20, uh, probably 25 services or so running in production. And every single one of them is based off of this template. Uh, so, uh, and we constantly keep it updated and so on as well. So <clears throat> that is probably the best uh, example of an event-driven application I can go with. So really quick, let's talk about reality. So to do event-driven, uh, the, I guess this is more like the hard parts really about event driven and what makes it hard is that, uh, so first things, first is you need to understand your message bus tech really, really well. Uh, you need to get everybody to be on board and that means that you're going to be doing a lot of convincing. You're going to need to convince your leadership, your architecture teams, your engineering in general. Um, you're going to be responsible for essentially evangelizing this entire concept as to like why this needs to be the next, uh, next way to do things. You're going to be writing lots of example code, all kinds of flows, docs, and so on. <clears throat> you will need to accept that the, the event bus is your source of truth. So, of course, it means that, uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that the event bus m m be, must be the uh, exact uh, place where data originates actually it still can be a database but the point is that once an event actually goes on the event bus that it, it at that point it becomes the source of truth actually you need to embrace eventual consistency you need to embrace and fully understand how to implement item potency and as a side note instead of leaving it to all the developers to do on their own you should probably provide some sort of a boilerplate method to how to do item potency um, how, or how to implement it. And that's where the etcd stuff comes in with some sort of state, uh, state management uh, functionality. You can most, most definitely anticipate more complex debug um, because things like distributed tracing are not entirely going to work. Uh, you're going to have to do some greenfield implementation yourself, right? Uh, meaning that you're going to have to add something on top of events to include this information. You can most definitely uh, anticipate writing more complex Go. Um, and then I specifically added a red, red, uh, red arrow here because by far all these other ones uh, pale, I think, in comparison to getting everybody on board. Uh, it is totally an organizational, potentially partly political part that you need to get everybody to agree that this is the way to do things uh, from, from here on out. And that is not necessarily easy because, uh, especially depending on the size of your organization and so on. So let's talk about the reality of Go and what does it actually look like in Go. So if you haven't done Go routines, you will most definitely have to do Go routines because you're doing things asynchronously. So you're going to want to make use of, well, pretty much like, the most well-known feature of Go, which is you're going to launch Go routines. You're also going to want to learn, uh, you're going to want to know how to actually share your workloads. And um, you would utilize, you know, weight groups for this, you'd utilize channels, all that sort of stuff. You'll also want to control your Go routines, like meaning uh, the life cycle of a Go routine, be able to shut it down, get it to sleep, get it to not do anything, that sort of a thing. You're going to make use of locks and mutexes, that is for sure. Uh, in most cases, localized locks are going to be fine. In some smaller cases, you're going to want to have a distributed lock. For that particular case, having an etcd lock or having a mechanism in etcd to perform locks is super awesome. You're going to, be, you're going to want to be comfortable working with channels. That's a really big thing. Understanding the reason of why you'd want to use a buffered channel somewhere and how is it going to affect performance versus why you'd want to use an unbuffered channel somewhere. Uh, select is a big one, right? Uh, for select, you're going to want to care about things like how do, you, how do you perform a blocking select or a blocking read from a channel or how do you perform a non-blocking read from a channel and why is it a good idea or a bad idea in a particular case. And then tickers and timers. 
Essentially, we're talking about time.sleep. It happens all over the place, even though it sounds really bad, like a go-to. It's basically, it's basically one of your weapons. Uh, you, of course, there's tickers and timers themselves as well, but the thing is that, yeah, don't be ashamed in using that time.sleep if you have to. So uh, I think the most important thing from all of these, though, is like uh, all of them are quite important, but <laughs> the one thing that I continuously still run into over and over is that I wish that I made use of context.context .context somewhere because at some point in time you uh, decide that, oh, you know what, I want to actually instrument this function and get some sort of metrics for it or whatever else and you had to go back, add context all over the place um, and it's just like, it's just a pain really. So it's much nicer to not have to do any of that stuff. So. Who should be trying event-driven? So the cheap answer for, for that, uh, kind of a cop-out answer, I guess, is the fact that uh, anybody that's okay with eventual consistency. But I think the, the answer goes significant, can go significantly deeper. So I think anybody that's doing uh, already uh, handling async workloads, that's a big one. Uh, anybody that's dealing with high throughput, uh, and that means like high throughput as in resources or bandwidth. Anybody is dealing with uh, big data. In big data, you're doing so much async to begin with, you have to do batched work to begin with, that it just simply makes sense um, for that event-driven could be introduced as well. And if your shop is super comfortable with concurrency, uh, with concurrent concepts and parallelism, uh, then it might be a decent fit as well. So specifically, we're talking about uh, fintech, gaming, security, data science, communications, uh, analytics, and travel, and there's probably many, many other ones. I put an asterisk to all of these because every single one of them has a case where, well, like some particular play area that it does not make sense to do event-driven at all. So, and that will go for the next slide the same way as well. With that said, still it ultimately boils down to the fact that are you okay with eventual consistency? Uh, but there's, well, there's, there's a bunch of other, other uh, issues that might come in. So who should absolutely avoid event-driven altogether? So if the idea of eventual consistency really scares you and it's, uh, your business can absolutely not function without it, which is uh, extremely rare, uh, by the way, as a side note. In most cases, um, most businesses can operate with eventual consistency. It's just that they cannot operate it with that concept across the entire stack, right? Like meaning that they could operate with eventual consistency for let's say 70% of their stack and it would be totally fine. With that said, if you're not comfortable with that um, and you need exactly one semantics and you absolutely cannot lose any data, uh, then in that case, it might be a decent choice uh, or, or it might be a, a reason to avoid <laughs> event-driven altogether. Um, and this comes down to really to banking, high-frequency trading, human resources. But again, there is an asterisk in there because uh, it, there's, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, uh, it needs to be avoided completely. Uh, just some particular areas like, so for instance, uh, for uh, human resources, you may not want to utilize event-driven for calculating time off. Somebody will get angry at some point in time. Um, but at the same time, sending a reminder email about something, probably okay. So the takeaway from all this is that event-driven is not really a silver bullet, right? Um, and it's also totally okay to have some parts that are still remain completely synchronous. It's not that big of a deal if there are some parts that are synchronous. Uh, it's just the fact that if you utilize event-driven, you will likely not need some of those parts and you will improve things as a result. So while you probably have learned a lot right now and you are almost an expert and event-driven, uh, you still may want to do some evening reading with a cup of tea. There have been a lot of articles written uh, about event-driven and event-driven like architectures and so on. And there are some random links in there uh, with some, some good material. So <clears throat> my observations here really are that, uh, this is like a, one of the final slides here, is that event-driven is not new. Event-driven has been around for a really long time. It is uh, just that it's become more accessible than ever before. Event-driven is uh, now actually more doable uh, because 
compute has become cheaper and so has storage. And our, I think, our comfort level with complexity has dramatically increased, like to a point where, uh, for example, like Kubernetes, uh, uh, imagining Kubernetes 20 years, uh, 20 years ago would be crazy. It's so complicated, all right? And now we are totally okay with it. I remember when Mesos and the stuff before Mesos ca even came out as well, uh, these papers that were written about this, this concept of orchestration, and I thought that it was really complicated. I don't think so anymore. I think it's actually pretty straightforward at this point. And I think the same sort of thing is happening with event-driven. Um, so uh, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, essentially, if you want to achieve higher levels of reliability and higher levels of scale, you are eventually going to do asynchronous. And if you want to be able to contain that chaos that happens and you want to have some sort of rules around this, you need to create some sort of guardrails. And the guardrails are, well, this event-driven concept, this event-driven architecture though, that provides all the guardrails. And I'm going to finally leave you with one bit of, a, I guess, of a prediction of sort is that I totally foresee that in the near future, we're going to get much more comfortable with event-driven. And event-driven concepts are going to be uh, just as common, essentially, as microservices as well. Same sort of thing that happened with sysadmin starting to do DevOps and having to migrate to that, that point. So with that said, you have achieved reliability in Nirvana. Yeah. All right. So. My final slide here is really just uh, if you enjoyed this talk, if you like the, the stuff that we talked about here, like uh, if you like event driven systems, if you like architecture talk and so on, come talk to me. I am on the Gopher Slack. I'm also on the, the Discord for GopherCon. Um, or just yeah, ping me on email, the good old fashioned communication device.